You are listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. Thank you for downloading and subscribing. Coming to you virtually live from high atop the historic Raleigh building in beautiful downtown Raleigh. The NCF&B takes the listener behind the scenes to tell the stories of the people that contribute to the creation of the food and beverage community of North Carolina. And now, the misfits in the dish pit, the faces of the front. They are Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss. And we continue our coverage back in studio. Very happy to be back in studio. And today, joining us in studio is the creator and owner of the Durham Food Hall, recently opened, of course, in Durham, Ms. Adair Mueller. Welcome. Hi, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Yeah, same here. Thanks for being in studio. Now more than ever, we are always like more appreciative. Like, oh, you're here, and we see we see you. And you were you were masked up. You were you were practicing. Yeah, got all my the... sanitizer. You know, we're distanced. Yeah, we can we can do it and still enjoy. Exactly. All the microphones have been uh, wiped down wiped thoroughly. Down. The surfaces we're all clean. We're all good to go. Exactly. <laughs> and then just in case we have bedlam vodka on the table to act as a sanitizer <laughs> for inside and outside and on our hands. And everywhere, if we need to, that would have been a great advertisement for Bedlam Vodka. Had they been just uh, (laughs) send the checks to Five Harrogate Street, (laughs) that's right, Raleigh, uh, Unit Four Hundred Nine. That's where we're at here, high atop the Raleigh Building, uh, which is a dismally wet afternoon, and it looks like it's going to be like this for the rest of the day, raining on our parade. But uh, but that's not going to stop business here, and that's uh, that's what we're going to talk about. We're talking about the Durham Food Hall. You know, Adair, the first time that I reached out to you to be on the show was like... Over a year ago. 15 probably. months ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I was like, hey, this would be really fun. Like, what a cool idea. You've got a lot happening. You've got many different eateries and drinking establishments and all these different collections of businesses coming together in one business uh, under a large roof. Uh, let's dis- let's discuss. And you, you know, appropriately responded, I would love to, but let's get, let's tell that story when we get closer to actually <laughs> opening. And then, yeah, what feels like an entire lifetime went by before today. And so... I know it's. There have been many trials and tribulations to get to the point where you're even at now, and you're not even a hundred percent wholly open. But even to that, maybe we can kind of just start right there from that, that point on when we were, when the the food hall was being kind of announced and created mm-hmm. as to the struggle that it has been to get to here. It's been a ride for sure. Um, it was very much a chicken and egg process too. When I when the concept hit me and I was really inspired living in New York City to open a business like this, then figuring out where to place it, settling on Durham, needing some investment, needing chefs, needing a space. So much of it was what comes first. You know, investors want to know that you have chefs that they are willing to pay the amount that you need them to pay to. In order to get those costs, you need to have the location set. You need to have more details in line. You know, it was so much of this kind of back and forth and just trying to, you know, fake it till you make it and work along the way. Um, and so we moved around locations a couple of times, um, really wanting to be in like a an area that's finding a resurgence right now in Durham, but it just wasn't the right time for the development. There was some unclear future and business decisions just needed to be made. So found the space that I'm in now, which honestly, you know, things happen for a reason and it couldn't be a better space for us. Um, We're really in the heart of downtown. We're right across from the farmer's market, which I think has some incredible synergy. Our chefs are going there, you know, on a regular weekly basis, talking to the farmers, sourcing different ingredients from them, uh, which was really important to me. I have a a business degree, but also coupled with sustainability background. And so I wanted Durham Food Hall to be sustainable from the ground up. And I knew that was part of what helped me um, select the chefs that I did. I wanted folks that would come in already having those values versus chefs that were just telling me what I wanted to hear to be a part of the hall. I knew that might end up cutting corners at some point, you know, and me having to play more police. So all of our chefs are really cognizant and aware about how they're sourcing and what they're sourcing. 
which makes that dynamic with the farmer's market even better. And then things, you know, the city of Durham had never seen a food hall before. It's 15,000 square feet. We actually built a whole 3,000 square foot mezzanine, which because of the building, we were hoping that it could be a wooden structure, but it ended up having to be a steel structure, which you know, tripled some of the costs that we had and the numbers estimated because the steel was so expensive and so much of it. Um, And then the building didn't have enough power for our use. Mm. I mean, literally just didn't have enough power. So had to work with Duke Energy to get more transformer units installed outside of the building, bring power in. That was a whole ordeal because, you know, there's so much development going on in Durham. So Duke's like, hey, we... We, we have our own schedule and timetable. Yeah. You know, we can't just pop in. And to them, this was a small project. To us, we're like, this is a multi-million dollar, you know, there's 10 different businesses in here. Like, this is a huge project. And they're like, yeah. Have you seen the skyscrapers around? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Not yeah. on our standard. Um, and then even things, you know, we have seven different hoods in the space cooking. And the chase systems that were already built into the space just would not function for th- for that. Um, one of those is a wood fire oven. So that needs to have its own chase system separate from everybody else. And so we had to actually punch out the back of the building to where the parking deck is, go up the side of the exterior to then get all of our chase and duct work done, which then required a ton of extra engineering. The landlord, you know, had to get very heavily involved because then we're penetrating the side of their building at multiple spaces. They wanted to make sure people couldn't climb on it. You know, there's just so much that had to be done there. So that's just enough to make you like, why did you keep doing it? <laughs> but before you even got there, yeah, I mean, you had a vision, you had a thought. I, I want to understand, okay, I think your conception of this or maybe your aha moment was way back in 2015, mm-hmm. or at least that's the first time this has ever been writ- written about. Mm-hmm. But uh, what made you want to do a food hall and then. Uh, Going through that, you know, you see all these other food halls popping up. Uh, did that throw you off the course or make your belief even stronger? In it? Honestly, it made my belief even stronger. I was happy and excited because then folks could have that comparative. Um, you know, I was living in New York at the time. I always knew I wanted to start my own business. My parents are entrepreneurs. My grandfather was. It's just in my blood. But not necessarily in the food industry. You Correct. Didn't know, okay. Totally different. None of them have been in the food industry, and even I hadn't been in the food industry before. I had a business degree, and I'd worked for startups my whole entire career, but more in sales and software. So, you know, uh, the food the food world was very foreign to me other than the fact that I love to eat food uh, and I appreciate good food. But I also knew when I was in New York, that was when I really became passionate about the food hall mm-hmm. as the idea. Um, I had constantly throughout my my college years, high school even, tried to find partners. I realized, okay, you need you know investment and capital for a lot of business new businesses, but it's also really nice to have that sounding board and somebody to help and you know bounce ideas off of and just to be in the trenches with you. I had kept trying to search for that partner and it just wasn't happening. I would find someone, you know, a good friend or a colleague, and they'd be really into it, but then just couldn't you know, take the final leap with me. Mm -hmm. And so I ultimately just said, all right, I got to, you know, go the road alone and hopefully you build it and they'll come Um, more of that style. And so being in New York at the time, my friends and I would travel, you know, 40, 50 blocks or even to a completely different borough over the bridge into, you know, Brooklyn just to go to some really cool food halls. And for a Manhattanite, that's not normal. You stay within like a five block radius, maybe even two blocks. (laughs) You know, you're you're very uh, you've got everything you could ever want within a small space, um, small area. And so I thought, why are we going this far? And especially when there are still tons of restaurants around us, you know, incredible food scene, but we're traveling to these food halls. What is it about that? And part of it was the environment and the atmosphere, the gathering style, the buzzing energy, but also the, you know, you could do a quick in and out or you could spend hours. Um, and that was really nice. You didn't have, you know, wait staff and wait service and feeling like you needed to be pressured to leave your table or, you know, let somebody else in. There was more than enough space. And it was also the fact 
fact that we could enjoy multiple cuisines mm-hmm. in one. So if the three of us went together, we didn't have to agree on anything. We could each yeah. be very satisfied with what we wanted and, you know, comply with any dietary needs or just feelings at the time, um, which is very unique. And, and that's hard to do in a restaurant sometimes. So yeah. you want pizza. Oh, but I want sushi. Yeah. You want steak sandwich. Yeah. And that's, you want deli. But that's a great, that's probably the best uh, benefit from having food halls, right? I mean, you don't have to. Everybody has their own eating styles now, and what they're what they're doing, and you don't have to be like go along with the flow, and then just I'll just have the salad or something, right? Like, right. Be no, stuck everybody, with something. yeah. And so obviously, like here, we're just a few blocks away from Transfer Food Co. Uh, Transfer Food. We're just down the block from Transfer Co. <laughs> so you could do that, and we're also just a few blocks down from Morgan Street Food Hall. So kind of to the left or right of us, we have a lot of options here in downtown Raleigh. But that. But that hasn't really been the case in Durham, at least Mm -hmm. in the sense that with Durham, you do have a lot of great little dining establishments all over. But they're all spread out and kind Mm -hmm. of around here. So, yeah, uh, the building, I did want to know, just going back to when you're talking about that. The building was uh, was created for this, correct? It was, or th- you're not taking over an old building and repurposing it, right? Correct. Yeah, so it's a whole new establishment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just south of of Main Street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can street. see Major the Bull on a clear day, yeah. and the Christmas tree when it lights up, you know, on the holidays, which nice. is really nice. Yeah. Um, the building is brand new. It's based off of a historical building, Liberty Warehouse, which was one of the oldest running tobacco auction houses in the southeast. Um, was even running and selling tobacco through the 80s. Mm. And it was a very well-known tobacco auction house. In order to get farmers to sell your tobacco at your auction house, you had to have different perks for these farmers to draw them in. Liberty always had lodging. They always had Liberty Cafe, where you could eat and drink. And they were one of the first to have satellite bank offices on site at the warehouse. So not only could the farmers sell their tobacco, they could also get a check cut right on the spot and then go downtown and enjoy some of the downtown uh, venues. So that was very unique to Liberty. Um, And then when its tobacco days uh, were over, the Stones, who owned the building, they transformed it into kind of an artist haven. And so there were a bunch of artist studios in there. You know, artists don't care as much that they're in a a beautiful space versus raw bones. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was a great place for artists, and it was wide open, you know, big space. But then the ownership trans... transferred hands and those owners um, just didn't keep up the building as much as uh, it should have been. It needed a lot of maintenance. It was an old building. And so eventually the roof caved in and that was how it was rebuilt into the apartment building that it is today. And the food hall has taken over two of the largest retail spaces in the bottom of this apartment building. So they weren't necessarily built for our use, um, as we described earlier in the, the pod. You know, if if they were, we would have had better utilities, better chase systems, a lot of other back of house, uh, yeah. you know, infrastructure there for us. But it was a dirt floor and cinder block walls when I uh, took over the space. Well, thinking about all of those artists and where they live makes me think about uh, our good friends over at the Folks Foundation, uh, who are champions champions of all good things crafted in North Carolina and the folks that make them. Folks Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit, and through ongoing grants and their publication, The Folks Journal, you can find out more and read their journal online for free at folksfoundation.org. And the coolest thing right now is you can also support them and artists by purchasing their new compilation vinyl album called The Carolina Quarantine Project, where Carolina-based musicians and duos showcase songs that were written while sheltered in place and uh, the vinyl album is already on sale like an actual vinyl album that you know maybe we could like it's scratch cool. a little bit matt matt's a really good uh, record scratcher oh, dj nice. from back in the day and so uh so he could do that all the sales go directly to the artists so make sure that you support live music support musicians support arts in general uh and by doing that one way is to support the folks foundation go to folksfoundation.org and one day they're going to hopefully open that awesome cocktail bar in New Bern. I know. Yeah, which would oh. be great. Is that, you getting thirsty over here, Matt? 
Well, uh, I am getting thirsty, <laughs> but and and that's also, I guess, a good part to talk about is, well, as we transition and talk about business in the food hall, you guys set up two bars there, and one is actually named the Riggs Bar. Who, uh, from what I understand, uh, the gentleman with the Speed last name Riggs. Of Speed Riggs was actually the one who invented auctioneering as we know it today. Like, who's got ten here? Who's got ten here? Ten going once? You know that whole thing. Um, he was very famous <laughs> for his melodic. Yes, yeah, like hey, no, 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 no. no. Right. You know, his yeah. sing, his oh, auctioneer yeah. sing. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't want to spend the whole podcast on this, but obviously it's important. You've been conceiving of this idea, working on it for a very long time. And eventually I want to get into how you curated the chefs and all that. But you couldn't open, obviously, because of mm-hmm. the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And now you are open for the pandemic. So what was the decisions that went into that? And how are you functioning now? At first, we so we had wrapped up right as murmurings of COVID were starting, and we thought, all right, let's ride it out. Maybe it's only going to be a couple weeks. You know, <laughs> we having no idea right. what this actually was um, and how intense it would be. And then once it became very clear that this was our new normal for uh, you know a very inevitable future. Um, we just realized we couldn't wait. You know, a lot of us had... When was the original opening target date? So we were trying to open right around the beginning of March. Okay. Um, And it was, you know, one of those things where we just had to... It was a very tough decision to make because even now, you know, we're not getting the traffic. We're not even getting the publicity. It's very hard to um, – we've reached out to a lot of different, you know, news outlets, and they have so much more, uh, you know – Pressing concerns. Pressing concerns, yes, absolutely. And we by no means feel like we are, you know, the concern. So it has been a really strange time um, to open because it's more of like a, a slow burn if you will. Yeah. And a lot of folks are coming by and they're saying, oh my gosh, you know, I was just walking on the street. I didn't even know you were open. We're like, yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, it is an interesting time right now. And of course, like Matt and I have discussed like with topics and what we want to discuss and certain things either seem tone deaf or just, uh, it's not even tone deaf. It's like, it doesn't matter. It's not important. Right. Uh, so even that with like all the COVID stuff and all that, we said that you're not totally open right now because mm-hmm. right now you're doing curbside and takeout, right? Correct. That's not what you want to do because you have a ton of space to invite many people to so come in. So much space. We bought close to like 500 different chairs and seats. You yes. Know? So, th- yeah. yeah. And you have two bars and you have uh, co-working spaces and event for spaces. event spaces. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what are we doing with all this space? How do you feel? What is your next move with all this in a way, it's been uh, positive to have the space for us just because we've been able to set up a very well-spaced out and safe entry and exit kind of path for vendors. So we have two main doors, and we're using one as enter, one as exit, so folks can come through. They don't have to worry about doubling back around on each other or you know getting clogged up. Um, it's also given us a great space to have pickup tables for each of our 10 vendors and allowed us, again, to space things out to a way that you know it does feel comfortable for everyone who is coming in. We do require masks. We have sand hand sanitizer everywhere. We buy it by the gallon. You know, we're constantly cleaning and sanitizing, which I think, in a, as you guys know, in a restaurant scenario, you're already doing much of that on a very regular basis. Right. So it's it's ingrained in the culture of a food and beverage establishment to do this. We have certainly amped it up. Um, and, you know, we're sanitizing bathrooms before and after every use, only used for staff, and really limiting even the amount of staff uh, that's there. It's tough for some of our vendors, you know, there, um, while we have large space, there are areas like we've had to create kind of certain like knocking codes on doors and the walk in coolers and some of the shared spaces where it's yeah. like, you know, signifying to someone else, there's someone in here, um, or I'm coming out, you know, step away. So there's definitely a lot that, you know, um, we're, we're changing our habits, but I think we are very, thankful that we do have the square footage to be able to spread out. Um, 
And, you know, I think we're going to stay with takeout for the foreseeable future. It's very difficult. It's become clear to our vendors that it would be difficult to take in the amount of online orders and to-go orders as well as walk-up service. And to do both at the same time would be really difficult. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of said, all right, let's master the takeout game. You know, they've already transformed their menus anyways, because again, you're, you're going through a completely different process. The customer might not actually eat this food, you know, for 12, 20 plus minutes, you know, cause they've got to drive back in their car and get home. Yeah. Um, so it's a very different, you know, menu item, first of all, that these chefs have had to create versus what they would have dining in house, uh, that you would eat right away. So, you know, they've already done a lot of reinvention and pushing themselves. So to do both at the same time would be a a stretch. Um, So we're going to just master this takeout game. We do have that 3,000 square feet upstairs, though, for private event space. And so we're going to start doing some intimate events uh, where, you know, it's capped at maybe 10 people, 12 people, even less than that, six to eight. And let folks gather. We're going to start to have a full wedding venue that we, you know, are providing for guests where they can come in and just with a small group, um, go ahead and have that special day, that meaningful time. We've got the lounge up there. And so we can do a nice toast. We've got all of our vendors downstairs. We can provide, you know, wedding cakes and food and just make it a really special space and still, you know, celebrate that moment, yeah. uh, but just on a different scale. So that's kind of what we're easing into at the moment. Even our lounge upstairs, the Riggs Lounge, we want to start a reserve ahead program where you can reserve a day or two in advance, tell us how many people are going to be in your party, and then we can have space ready and available for you that is you know, more than six feet apart from others in the lounge. You can order food downstairs, bring the food up, and then have some actual cocktail service and relax a little bit. If it, you're from the same household, you can have you know mass down. You can enjoy. Um, so we're we're gonna start slow and and just you know yeah hope that we get the support we need. I have to ask because it, I mean I'm sure I, I would assume that all of your business plan, you being a business person, was written completely on the idea of having people congregate volume, volume getting as many <laughs> people volume. 500 seats filled, bars filled, and now you have to do I guess not a complete reverse, but a much different thinking so the business person in you like how do you go forward from that like what are the solutions and just to be frank how long can you sustain under the current uh rules of social distancing and mostly takeout yeah it's a that's a tough question one that we try not to think about too much um is you know how long is this actually going to last right um and how long are we going to be forced to, you know, uh, function this way? And I think, you know, as a business person, it is constantly pushing me to innovate. And that's why I've really always gravitated towards small businesses and startups. We're very lucky that these are nimble businesses. So all of us have small, tight-knit teams. Many of our concepts, you know, owners are present every day. Mm-hmm. So it's truly, you know, owner-operated. Um, so we all have a very vested interest in seeing this through, collaborating together, trying to figure out what we can do to, you know, make this kind of online and takeout game more attractive, whether that's putting packages together. We've put a bunch of Father's Day packages together, which have items from multiple vendors. You know, they're cross-collaborating a lot, baking and making things for each other. Right now, supply chain is, you know, a little up in the air too. So our vendors are really helping each other out, um, which is nice to see. You know, I've always wanted it to be a community space. That's why I gravitated towards the model of a food hall in general. And I wanted it to be a community space, not only for our guests that were coming in, but also for the chefs and the businesses and this kind of incubation, you know, for them, much like a co-working space would be, Mm -hmm. um, but just for food and beverage. So it's definitely pushed us to becoming inventive and, and coming up with some new ideas. We're very grateful for that. 
a lot of folks are, are getting to a point, you know, even Napoli Pizza, I mean, he's doing frozen pizzas and his gelatos by the pint. You know, he wouldn't have done that previously, but it's actually doing really well. And he can now have a sustainable business off frozen pizzas and, yeah. you know, these amazing pizzas, um, not your average grocery store frozen pizza type of thing. And so I think it is really pushing us to try, you know, even these mixers that we've got from our auctioneer bar something we would have never done before. We would have never bottled mixers and juiced our own, you know, pr- local organic produce for anything other than service in house. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely, you know, uh, having that effect of just idea churn. And I think that's also, I, I was taught very early on in my entrepreneurial career that that's a, a great sign of an entrepreneur is that you're constantly asking what's next versus, you know, getting stuck in that kind of dwell or spot of, man, this is really tough. Um, So even from the beginning, to me, it wasn't really a question of, once I realized COVID's here to stay, it wasn't a question of, will we open? It was just how. Yeah. Um, and, And we're doing it, you know, and I think we... At this point, we kind of, we joke that we live for the weekends um, in the sense that the weekends get really busy, which is great. We have the farmer's market on Saturdays across the street. That's a huge draw. Folks are out. They're enjoying, you know, the outdoors. We have a massive central park so you can go grab your food and have a picnic outside. Um, But during the week, it is, it does get tough. And days like today, I mean, the rain, I guarantee you it's going to just completely you know, folks are not walking around and coming to pick up food. Right. Um, they're going to hunker down with a blanket and Netflix, which, you know, I can't, <laughs> I can't blame them. So, okay, let's talk about what you've got right here because this is just, this is fun, right? We, we don't all have to talk about the doom and gloom of not uh, having all this stuff. So there are some really cool products that are coming out of chaos, uh, in, in chaos lies opportunity. And yeah. so you guys are c- coming up with an idea of having these prepackaged cocktail Mixers. Mixers. And so I'm looking at, you have a beetroot Mary. Uh, so obviously beets. And this is, a, was it best mixed with vodka, gin, tequila, fino sherry? Oh, that that's nice and geeky and cool. Yeah. Can I just cool. say, I just tasted it. It's awesome. It's like very savory. I mean, it tastes like a beet, goat cheese, green onion salad. In it. Yes. I mean, I personally love that. But I, I mean, I think for Bloody Mary drinkers, they would love it. Yeah. So. Ooh, yum. It's a great and brunch option. You have an old fashioned syrup, uh, which is, you know, typically yeah, mixed with like a bourbon or rye or dark rum or something like that. I just mixed. I mixed all of these with the aforementioned Bedlam vodka, just because they're from Durham and it was on my back bar. And you brought a bunch of booze, so or <laughs> yeah. mixers. So why not? And then you also have, of course. The Bloody Mary mix, uh, best mixed, of course, with vodka, gin. You could do tea, tequila, sherry. I like the idea of sherry. That's fun. It's low fun. ABV. We call it our sherry Mary. Yeah. It's a low ABV, but adds a totally different layer of flavor right there. And you're putting cool ingredients in this, like this particular, the Bloody Mary one, tomatoes, carrots, celery, onion, garlic, mushrooms, mushroom broth, apple cider, vinegar, liquid aminos, horseradish, salt, and pepper. That is very Cool. It's vegan. It's a vegan Bloody Mary, so no Worcestershire. It has the oh, liquid wow. aminos in place of that, which is part of our sustainable uh, foundings. You know, the Durham Food Hall is founded on sustainable values, and we try to encompass and, and incorporate that in everything. And so this is all local produce. Um, lots of it, it is from Happy Dirt. Some of it's from Hungry Harvest, which is second grade uh, produce. Hey, and friends of the podcast, Hungry Harvest, yeah. Yeah. So we, we have enjoyed these. And and we have a ton of different flavors. Um, cucumber basil has been a really popular one. Lemon mint. We have some Moscow mule right now. We did the old fashioned thinking of Father's Day. Uh, that yeah. might be a good dad gift. You know, I put it on with, with vodka, but to be honest, it's it's awesome. Like, it's, I totally broke the bartending rule with vodka and old fashions, but it works. I mean, it's oh, sweet and yummy and... Who cares? Or you need yeah, your bartender there. Uh, certification pulled. <laughs> um, well, and of course, these are all created by Brad Farron, who is your beverage director and of uh, also made his 
is from North Carolina, but also made his bones in New York. That's right. He's got some published cocktails and a few different books and um, he's, he's doing his thing. So he, this is definitely, you know, these are his brainchild. We kind of were trying to figure out what can we do? North Carolina has some crazy ABC restrictions when it comes to off premises. <laughs> yeah. never discussed <laughs> Who would have that? known? Do tell. <laughs> um, so for off premises consumption, we're not allowed to sell anything with liquor. Right. Uh, so that's why these are virgin. And we also are restricted to repackaging. So the beers and wines and vermouths that we can sell, we're not allowed to actually repackage those. They have to stay in the manufacturer's packaging. So we have other cocktail kits where you get a full bottle of, it does come with the booze, yeah. and you get a full bottle of each, full bottle of the vermouth and capoletti and some bitters and stuff, depending upon the... Oh, so you can do kind Next. of like low ABV, uh, not like anything a, that would be sold under a, a wine, wine shop. shop. Yeah, wine mm-hmm. shop. Yeah, got it. Which is a good Sparkling time. Wine. Anything that you could get at a Triangle Wine Company. Oh. So. Yeah, that's right. But but what if I don't live in Durham? What if I live in Holly Springs or Southern Pines or Morrisville or or Cary? <laughs> well, guess what, Max? Yes. You'd be in luck. Oh. They have four locations <laughs> in all the places you just mentioned. Yeah, I li- I have four homes in all of those places, and <laughs> right. so so convenient. I only live where Triangle Wine Company exists. And it's not a bad idea. Yeah, because I like that they rule do have all of your beverage needs. So if you ran out of the vermouth and you got a cocktail kit from Durham Food Hall, you could just swing by and get a curbside delivery from Triangle Wine Company at these times. Um, or you could perhaps order online. Yeah. And, uh, they'll then deliver also, to your house. They would deliver to you. Yeah. One of your four homes. <laughs> In, that's right. Yeah. And uh, also, don't forget to use the NCFB promo code and you will receive a nice discount. Yeah. TriangleWineCode.com. You said innovation and technology is a lot of innovation too. I know just from personal experience, especially just over this weekend, I've been helping my friends back over at Y Hill. I'm a Y Hill Kitchen and Brewing. We've had them on the show pre- previous and I was there. I, I helped open the place and then I stepped aside for a few months and then throughout this whole ordeal and trying to figure out a game plan to reopen, it really like I, I always am so compelled to just be back in restaurants and, and to do what I do. And it's like, I love recording podcasts and all that, but like, you can't keep me away from this too long. And I love the challenge and I also wanted to create some support. And so there was a lot of reasons, factors of just like, I, I want to be a part of this. I want to figure out how we can figure out a way to be open and, and fine. And we're not perfect. And we probably haven't done everything exactly right. We're not even officially open. Although when this podcast airs, it's, I think we'll be open. Trying to be open right now could also be considered part of the problem. But people are also trying to figure out what to do because if the, you know, if if the phase 2 rules are, hey, you can be open as long as you practice these certain standards, it's like okay, but even with that, I know that a lot of level-headed people that are trying to flatten the curve are like, I get that you can do that, but you're not helping the cause by doing it at all. Sure. It's it's a challenge because we're just we're humans too. We're trying to preserve business. We're trying to find ways, not ways around it, ways through it that are smart mm-hmm. and that hopefully can be a way that we can provide a path to those to say, hey, if we're gonna do this, then maybe this is the best way to do it. So I don't know. And again, I don't have answers. I'm just trying to come up with solutions and uh, just as you are too. Let's let's get deeper into the actual people that are doing things inside of the Durham Food Hall. Mm-hmm. I know that Angela and Marshall over at Exvoto, who we've had on the podcast before, when, way back when we were featuring uh, Centro and Gallo Pallone, their original model were, were, were tacos. And yes. of course, that's like an open air thing. There's a lot of uh, – ex- everything's exposed in a taco. And I believe they practiced, they decided to kind of change the model a little bit to be more burrito friendly. Yeah, part of that decision was because they were focused on a really unique craft called nixtamal, which is the process of using an heirloom corn from Mexico. It's the way the tortillas were meant to be made. But um, this corn is very dry and dense on the husk. So unlike our American corn that when you bite into it, you can sometimes almost get a little spritz that comes up. You know, our corn is very juicy. This heirloom corn is extremely dry on the husk already. And so in order to use it and mill it into flour, you have to soak it, you have to massage it. It's almost like a Wagyu beef type thing where you're just, mm. you know, um, going through a very laborious process to then result in this 
milled flour. And that was the basis of their con. That is still the basis of their concept. But because we've all scaled back a lot, I mean, you talked about the process. It has also made us realize what we can do with fewer people. Yeah. Right now, I have two employees, which are Brad Farron and Kristen Bettinger. They are complete lifesavers, and I'm so thankful to have them. But we were supposed to have, you know, I'm supposed to have like 25, 30 plus employees right now. Um, So we're all doing so much. But at the same time, because we can streamline and because we're not having that interaction with customers in the same way, it is, we are becoming much more efficient Mm -hmm, at what we are doing. And even, you know, as our vendors are moving their product from the walk-ins and their prep areas to the front of house cooking stalls, in normal capacity, they might have to be weaving through or, you know, excusing themselves through some passageways where our customers might be. At, right now, they don't have that. You know, it's just us. Um, so it is a much more open and, and kind of functional space for us as as makers Um in the hall. You know, I think we're still not quite getting the volume that we need just because to your point, folks aren't coming out. Um, and they're not, you know, venturing some, some still just aren't comfortable with that takeout, uh, mode. We do offer curbside pickup. So if you would like us to bring it out to your car, we can absolutely do that where you're not even having to leave, you know, your safe space and your zone. But we also have this process that we've set up where each vendor has a pickup station and a it's a table that's clearly labeled for each vendor. And so you as a customer, you can walk in and grab your meal from that table. So again, you don't have to even interact or touch someone to your yeah. point. And then you can safely walk out and exit the exit doors. We do have some a, a good process going. And if we could just get a little bit more volume of that, then you know we would you we would be set. Be profitable. Well, yeah. Not even profitable, we'll just keep the lights on. Yeah, well, and that you know, you talk about lights. I mean, I think that's that's really the the pressure on us right now is that there needs to be a systemic change from a much higher federal level that possibly gives our landlord some mortgage relief or you know something that trickles down yeah. for us because our rent isn't stopping. We have to maintain insurance. You know, we have all of us have bank loans or some kind of capital debt, whether it's you know through personal investors or through banks. That doesn't stop. So, you know, there's still a lot of pressure on us, even if we were to close or never have opened, you know, we we would just drown ourselves and drown the business before it ever be, began. So, yeah, and it's not like you know, paying paying rent to those that own the building. They're like, they're, it's not their fault. Right. And they're not evil people. They're not like they have bills that they have to pay to for exactly. their business. We're all just. We're all part of a big cog, but when we're when we're forcing or we need to force certain cogs to not turn, well, then nothing else turns, and and you can't look like oh my asshole landlord is charging everybody for the rent. It's like oh you mean he's just asking you to do what you to would help him upon? to pay his bank loan, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know like, that like, the yeah. banker is telling him I'm going to foreclose on you or take over your space, you know like yeah. they've so got the same pressures. Yeah, we're all we in that regard we're all in it together in the sense that we all have our own bills to pay. So unfortunately there is. There is little to say about like how we can mutually do it. Now, now some are just saying, screw it, I'll just not charge uh, rent. And it's like, that's cool that you could do that. Maybe financially you're sound enough to do that, but most people aren't. Right. And maybe that's part of the problem, too, is that most of us are just scraping by paycheck to paycheck, and then all those paychecks don't come in. So we have to figure that out uh, even more. Yeah. Well, I'm and curious. our leverage. You know, these buildings, like our building that we're in is, I think, a $50, $60 million building. It's not owned outright. You know, the the landlord got a bank loan for it. So right. to your point, like maybe there's some other issues there that, um, you know, but that's how capitalism works and that's how we set up our society. So, you know, we got to kind of work along with it in some ways. That uh, That makes me curious just in terms of food hall business in general, like how it works, and maybe you could enlighten us, or at least for the Durham food hall, how does it work? Like, so you take, you're responsible for the lease of the entire food hall, Mm -hmm. and then and then each person's you sublet a space out. Correct. That's basically how it works. Mm-hmm. And then, but there's no revenue sharing in terms of like food or anything. But there is only one revenue or well, one place that orders liquor, and then that revenue gets split. Can you share how that works? Because yeah. I know that more. I think we were talking about our Morgan Street and Transfer Code do the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. There's You're one. You're basically like a huge bar that rents out 
all of its spaces, right? So like uh, maybe at a parallel, you're almost like a, like a movie theater – uh, and the revenue that you're generating from the snack bar is yours, and then you you pay or you you charge a small fee or a large fee, whatever the fee is. You charge a fee for each vendor to be there, so it'd almost be like the revenue that you might get by showing this movie and showing that movie and all that. That's what brings the people in, or mm-hmm. the features you have, and then internally you're making the revenue from what you can produce, which is the bar program. Mm-hmm. The bar right? program and the events, yes. And the events, yeah. Yes, which is why we have the event spaces as well. Um, I had originally wanted to purchase a building, but the <laughs> vendors, yeah. I want to purchase a building too. <laughs> right, <but>. exactly. <laughs> uh, the vendors can only pay so much, and I think that's something that I learned really early on by talking to as many hall developers and owners as I could and said, you know, what is, what's the secret sauce? What do you wish you'd done differently? How do I set this up? You know, what things did you do right? Right? What things made you successful? What things would you change? And one of my mentors very early on said, vendors first. You have to watch out for the vendors first. Mm-hmm. And a lot of halls, it's tough. You want to monetize every single inch of the space. Yeah. But when you do that, then you realize, all right, you know, there's only ever going to be so many customers. So that's not going to change. So the more vendors we add, it just means the smaller piece You're of the pie they each pool, get. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, you know, if you charge them too much, then they're never going to make money themselves and you're going to have constant turnover or they're just going to be unhappy. And, you know, for it to be that kind of thriving incubator community space, you really do need to to make the numbers work and fit based upon, you know, put yourself in their shoes. Right. Um, and as an entrepreneur myself, I've, I tried to do that from day one and and really make the numbers to be something I felt I would you know, say yes to, and that I, in my own mind and business pro formas would see as being plausible and, and fair. So, you know, it is kind of one of those back and forth and the buildings, we could have certainly, you know, I could have gotten an investor to say yes to a building. That's actually what investors and banks want, because then they have that as collateral. Mm. If the business doesn't do well, you know, they still have that asset Mm -hmm. um, to then, you know, use uh, and, and capitalize on, collect on. But it the the buildings were just too cost prohibitive. Everything's so expensive around here. Real estate is just booming in the triangle. Um, And so you know, being in the space that we are while we while we are in a downtown building that is you know a luxury building, um, luxury apartment building, we are in a space where we're kind of like an additive, almost like a marketing expense for the building. Sure. Um, you know, they have all the apartments upstairs to really get their revenue from. So um, that that made it made a lot of sense for us to be in this space. And that's how we were able to inhabit, you know, this downtown yeah, spot. Yeah, in a large spot. It's not so uncommon then like to like a, like a hotel's restaurant. Most, mm-hmm. most hotel restaurants... It's like an amenity. Don't like... <laughs> The, the profitability of those restaurants isn't the key feature of that business. It's usually exactly. like we, we can take a loss because we're going to earn the revenue from the hotel rooms. But I do have a question to press you here for a second. For, so being profitable for the individual vendors of the restaurant, like we all know that in restaurants – the the bar is your baby. The, the 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 revenue you earn or the profitability of booze and wine and beer is huge. So how does that work for them? I mean, they have to really reestablish or rewrite their own business models. They do in a way. It's it is a different model in a hall because a you're not having nearly the upfront investment as you would with a standalone. You know, standalone restaurant you're going to spend at least half a million, if not well over a million dollars to open. Hmm. And you and mean if, for build out. And and permits and exactly yeah. and all your furniture and all of your equipment and even just you know toilets and sinks and I mean you you are having to the walk-ins you know you're having to really really spend in your infrastructure and then you also have to spend a lot in labor and in a food hall capacity you're actually walking into a space where there's so many shared and distributed costs mm. that something like the walk-in we have provided and that's actually incorporated in the cost so you're only paying one tenth of that cost mm. um, and things like bathrooms same thing all the furniture you know that I mentioned um, that we got from nomadic trading company and bull city designs built for us you know 
that's not a burden on each of our vendors. Right. And so their upfront initial investment might be more like 50000 or 80000 for the space. And yeah. then, um, you know, so maybe they're coming out around 100 or less than 100 themselves. So really depends on the concept. Um, you that's know, really true. I didn't think about that. Like even the maintenance of it and then like even buying tissue paper for the bathroom constantly and right. all that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. There's Mopping also another the floor. <laughs> right. They don't have to do that. Well, what you're speaking to, Matt, uh, with kind of that menu mix in a way that the bar tends to be the most profitable uh, to support, say, like a, a, a high food cost uh, food experience. Like if you look at the traditional fine dining experiences, the food cost can be like, you know, upwards of 35, 40 percent on food cost. And then the bar saves saves the day because you can, you know, you can make a a beer food cost be like 15 to 20 percent and and at certain cocktails you know can hover around that 25 percent but really in the end it's just how much how much bang can you get for your dollar so in my opinion and i don't know if this is true but i would assume that a lot of these quick serve type of restaurants are designed to be profitable at that lower rate anyhow so they're not serving food at 40 percent or at least they shouldn't be at 40 percent food cost their their profit lines are probably more in line with a really efficient beverage program. Mm -hmm. So whatever they're selling is at the same rate of profitability as the bar anyhow. So they kind of just are making product at the, at the same profit rate. Yeah. But that's got, I mean, I don't know if you can do it exact because typically bar programs usually run at around 20% like cost when you fa factor in everything. And how do you do that with like local seafood, which is one of your vendors? Because seafood, as we all know, is expensive. Yeah. And maybe for them, they're doing it on sheer volume too, because they're also doing a lot of direct to customer and they have multiple. Well, they have the wholesale, wholesale, the wholesale. Also, yeah. Some of it comes in the fact you know their food costs are high partially because we are a sustainable hall. Mm -hmm. So sourcing locally, organically, pesticide free. I mean that in and of itself is going to raise your costs a lot. Um, but they also only have to have maybe four or five items on their menu. Yeah, you know, and you so don't need to have text Eric. Text, yeah, text Eric. Yeah, yeah, if only we had Lynn Peterson on the show like probably four or five times already. Like, right. we'd, we'd know. <laughs> well, I saw Eric there the other day. Text Eric Mark Tagney. What's yeah. your food cost? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, but I think there's an efficiency with that too, right? Where are you providing cleaning staff, cleaning staff and all that? Yeah, because the, they do pay into them, but they again, in. they're paying a small fraction yeah, of the like cost. It's like an HOA each, or something. Exactly. So it's a shared and distributed cost. So it's much more affordable. Their labor costs are slashed as compared to, you know, full yeah. service restaurant. Their food costs aren't nearly as much. They also won't have as much food waste, hopefully, because they don't have that massive menu. They don't have to worry about, you know, 20, 30, 40 different menu items and their desserts and their starters and all that, you know, they can really just hone in and focus. Um, well, and let's not forget that this is also, in a way, could be considered an excellent incubator with low startup costs, but you develop a great idea, so much so that you could just do that idea again somewhere else. And mm -hmm. maybe that somewhere else you do is a full-blown restaurant with a beverage program and all, but this was your your easier, your, you know, entree. And your yeah. entree into the system to, to knock out and understand how to streamline your beverage or your food program. And so I think it's great. I mean, it's, it's super helpful to be able to have assistance like that in, mm -hmm. in, in a sense, you know, and then also if it doesn't work, the rate of failure is not as, uh, as steep as well. Like you didn't invest as much money into it as if you also purchased your entire restaurant and building, you know? Absolutely. And you mentioned marketing just then, you know, that's a huge asset that you get from being a part of a food hall. Mm -hmm. I mean, here I am representing Durham Food Hall, but we can talk about each vendor and we should. And, you know, that is just going to generate more buzz and each of them, somebody might come in thinking, oh, I'm going to get everything bagels, but then they're going to walk out having Lula and Sadie's, you know, scallop grit cakes because they smelled them and it smelled so good or they walked by them and saw it. Yeah. So, you know, it, it really, it helps helps generate a lot of, of business, which is part of what we're not getting. I mean, we are getting that right now, and, and we are getting some benefits on that side in that you can still place a to-go order from multiple vendors, and you can schedule it all for pickup at the same time. Yeah. So you can still enjoy all those multiple vendors. You're going to see them all on our website and when you go to order online. So they're getting that cross-marketing you know, marketing and that cross-pollination uh, from one another, and that's really helpful too. And we do have – so the ABC part was just kind of one of those conscious decisions of if we let 
each vendor have their own. The, the North Carolina ABC, again, just a little behind the times, right? Surprise again. <laughs> um, if we let each vendor have their own permit, that would mean that they would need to have clearly defined bounds of their quote unquote space. And so you'd only be able to take that drink so far mm-hmm. away from their stall. Yeah. And that would be really annoying to police and monitor. Exactly. And in our setup, then that, you know, just completely cuts the whole communal aspect into pieces. And you're then having to, you know, if we do decide on different concepts or if we wanted to go get items from different places and we wanted a wine pairing with that or a cocktail with that, then you're stuck. You're right. stuck at that stall. And it would eat into the space and the real estate of it all. And it just didn't make sense. And so we do have one permit for the whole hall. But I, again, wanted to put myself in the shoes of some of these folks. And, you know, many of them, if you mentioned, do have their own spaces where they are selling alcohol already. And so I do have a program with them where they can actually have a, you know, signature cocktail or some signature drinks that I give them a commission cut back from the sale of. Okay. Nice. Um, so just to kind of. Well, let's get into who, who's in. We're only, you know, 55 minutes in and we don't even <laughs> barely know who's in the Durham Food Hall. Who's in the Durham Food Hall? Our sumptuous eats. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned Lynn Peterson and the local seafood guys and Eric, who is a phenomenal chef. Oh, yeah. um, he had some trigger fish collars that he put out this weekend mm. that were amazing. I had never even seen what that would look like. And he fries them and seasons them. And it looks almost like a chicken wing, but you're looking at fish. But you see this collarbone sticking out, you know, and that's how you eat it. It's more like a chicken wing. You pick it up and, yeah. and bite through it. Oh, my gosh. So, so good. Good. And he's got crab rolls where he's making everything from scratch, including the roll itself. Just on point. Um, We also have Lula and Sadie's, which is Harry Moans and his son, Harry. And Harry has big Harry. So they're H2 and H3. Hmm. So they're a second and third generation uh, Harry's. So H2 has owned multiple restaurants throughout the years, catering services. He was very, very early to downtown Durham. He owned a restaurant called Timetable, which is now the spot where Bull McCabe's is. And this was way before Durham and downtown was anything. Um, But he had that foresight. And, you know, unfortunately, just the people didn't come soon enough. We, We, you know, American Tobacco I wasn't there. Nothing was around downtown. Um, but I think it's, you know, a really great moment for him to be back in downtown again in a brick and mortar setting. And you can tell, I mean, the people who come in, his people love him. And he makes the most amazing seasonal Southern fare. So he's got like incredible Nashville hot chicken sliders. He's got smoked chicken wings. Yum. He's got um, the grits cake that I mentioned, which have scallops from local seafood. A lot of them are, you know, again, cross collaborating. Awesome. Yeah. and using um, different items from one another. I think Liturgy Beverage, who is our coffee provider, which is Tim Jones, who used to manage all the Jabalas in the area, Jabala Coffee. Um, and Tim has won multiple. Uh, he's placed and won in, in national and world barista comp- championships and competitions, so he's really into his stuff. He had some extra milk the other day. He gave it to the guys at Old North Meats and Provisions, which is Joel Schroeder and Kevin Donnelly, and they made ricotta cheese out of it for mm-hmm. some of their the show. They uh, cheese provided spreads. us food at the original this is not a happy hour event and uh, and John Anton's a part of that yes. too they're all good friends of ours yeah that's super cool yeah so we've got a lot of that cross collab which is really fun for me to see and to your point of you know maybe this is that launching pad for them I mean it's, that's the case for Old North right this is their first brick and mortar and their first of this concept it mm. warms my heart it makes me so happy to think of them on to you know a next phase and potentially opening their own standalone sometime mm-hmm. um, that's exactly what I want to see, you know, and and that's, that's part of the fun and enjoyment of this incubator. So we've got those guys from Old North and they're smoking and curing their own meats and cheeses. Mm -hmm. They have an incredible pastrami sandwich on their menu right now. They do love veg too. So they have some great options for, you know, veggie lovers. They've got like a um, harissa roasted, carrot roasted sandwich. They've got a veggie tartine, some amazing vegetable sides, tons of pickles. They're so good at pickling and getting those flavors right and those combos. Um, And so that's been really fun to see 
them blossom. They're doing some grill kits where you can take some of their meats home and, and put it on the grill, which is what a, a lot of local seafood is also doing right now. We're kind of, you know, again, in COVID, we're, we're hearing different customer demands. And a lot of the ask is for larger portions of items that can be taken home and served over multiple days. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It yeah. does, right? And then it limits your exposure. You don't have to come out every night to grab food. Um, and so you're just coming out, you know, once or twice. So a lot of market fare is being presented. A lot of, you know, like I mentioned, those grill packs, a lot of yeah. larger um, where you, you get a full serving for multiple meals. The bagels? Everything oh, bagels, yes. yes. So Jen Kramer, she um, has come down from Philly, and her husband, you know, said, "All right, there's something up with North Carolina because I can't find these, you know, good bagels that I'm used to anymore." <laughs> um, and they're out in in Pittsburgh too, where they live. So certainly, you know, bench warmers and others are not around. She just started baking away as bakers do, and making in her home oven some really delicious bagels and thought, man, you know, this is it. And I got, I got to make something of this. She's one of those people that just never stops. And so even though she owns other bakeries in another state, she's like, more, <laughs> give me more to yeah. do, you know? And you're like, what, Jen? But she has some really fun flavor combos that she's doing. One of my favorite smears that she has is a kimchi cream cheese. And she's got a seaweed bagel. Targashi, right? Kimchi cream cheese. Kimchi yeah. cream cheese. <laughs> right. How many times can you say it fast? <laughs> she's got a seaweed bagel that you can put that on that's delicious and she's just got some amazing amazing concepts ray her chef is just a teddy bear of a guy and he is insanely you know talented at what he does with all of his flavor combos and and getting that stuff together so he's got some chili oils that he makes himself that you can drizzle on they have a build your own they've been having a lot of fun on instagram recently posting folks receipts of the crazy bagels that they've made themselves you know it's really fun just to see what people want to put together um what you can make they've got like a chickpea and greens spread that i love um that has some marinated greens and chickpeas in there and i do that with their veggie cream cheese and then their comte and rosemary bagel mm. oh it's so good I'm getting and hungry pizza right as well you, said, you mentioned napoli's early yes yeah guile um this is you know he one of the things that really drew me to guile was that he lets his he uses like a sourdough starter in his spreads for the dough yeah and he lets the dough naturally rise instead of adding the yeast and making it, you know, happen within hours. He he lets it just naturally take its time over the period of days. So it's got that really delicious, intense flavor in there mm. and additive, you know, health benefits and digestive properties. So his pizza is just incredible. And then, you know, it's that Neapolitan. He, he makes sure that he's got the wood fire going, uh, which is beautiful to watch, too. We just love the smells and, and the scene that comes from that. And then he also has gelatos and sorbets that he makes from scratch. And he's selling those by the pine, as we mentioned earlier, um, along with frozen pizzas, which is, you know, delicious. Um, so and that's a great spot. Desserts, you also have afters, is that right? Afters. Stephen Kennedy is extremely talented. He's been around the food scene a lot. He actually worked with Ashley Christensen here at Chuck's for a while, baking tons of, of burger buns uh, and, and doing that thing. He worked at Foursquare. He was the head pastry chef at Foursquare in Durham for quite oh, some yeah. time. Um, and this is his first entree on his own. And after his name, so he's, as, as a baker and a, a chef with a sweet tooth, he said he can never choose just one item to have for dessert. So his concept is going to be centered around little flights of desserts where you got like three to six little mini bites oh, wow. so that you don't have to compromise and right. you can try it all. And right now he is doing some of that, but he's also really morphing again with COVID. He's right next to Liturgy Coffee. And so they're doing kind of the morning scene uh, with everything bagels and they open at 7, 8 a.m. And so he's doing right now afters is doing a lot of uh, morning pastries, some scones that are out of this world. He has one that's a strawberry leather that he's made himself. It's like a almost like a gourmet fruit roll up, if yeah. you will. You know, that strawberry leather with some dehydrated lemons in there and some cultured butter that you can get on the side and just smear on. The, oh, it's so good. Because scones are supposed to be dry. <laughs> yeah. Larry David over here? 
<laughs> you <laughs> finally watched uh, the whole season, Matt? <laughs> oh, I watched the whole while ago. It only took you three months of quarantine to finally get through that curb, curb season? <laughs> Maybe a month. My That's God, a good one. Sp- speaking of that, I'm looking at pictures of, of, the, of like bagels from everything bagels. I mean, it- but we do have one more. We have Bowerbird Flowers. Um, so Bowerbird Apothecary and Flowers. Uh, she is a florist from Chapel Hill, and she sources strictly from local flower farms in the area. Mm. Has a gorgeous, gorgeous flowers to buy. She has flower subscriptions. She's got tons of plants. They also have an herbalist on staff. Um, and this is Diane Joyle and her daughter, Lily, who are the team behind Bowerbird. And their herbalist has made some really amazing tonics and elixirs and loose leaf teas. So it's just an all around feel good uh, space. You know, they make our, they make the hall beautiful with their flowers yeah. and blooms, but you can also just get some healing herbs and those vibes, those good vibes from them. So that's, that's a great one awesome. and ex voto you mentioned earlier yeah. um they've, they've got their burritos going strong so until they can do that next mile process and have the extra labor um and hire on which hopefully they will be able to do they've been you know um slow and steady climbing the sales ladder but i mean i'll i'll i will give them the biggest endorsement i i've been to a few of their pop-ups when they were doing that they did it they did one with ancillary fermentation beer and that was tremendous but i've gone to a couple of them and every time they put anything out it was it blew me away like it was just so damn delicious so really you've done a, an amazing job of curating a great group of creatives to put this all together so however you have to figure out a way to to dine there you, you know whether it's just takeout or or uh, banquets or, or uh, events it's it's going to be awesome and and i guess you know as as time progresses too you that we'll slowly be able to figure out how to increase business and get mm-hmm. everyone in there so it's awesome. Yeah, we're really excited. It was it, you know to me part of the one of the most fun at, aspects of this experience has been selecting the chefs. And I think my sales background really kicked in in doing so. I got hundreds and hundreds of applications of folks wanting to be in the hall. But really, those that ended up there are ones that I spearfished and and sought after myself yeah. because I saw what they were doing. I was inspired by them. I saw their quality of food. And I wanted that to be embodied in Durham Food Hall. And I think it's been really fun to f- see folks come in to A, try the food, see that in the food, see that in the space, just the design and the decor, you know, we really put a lot of time and intention in that, wanted it to be a place that you wanted to come not only for the eats and the smells, but also just as a space to, you know, be inspired by and as a space to hang and share. Um, So overall, we just wanted it to be very chef driven, very high quality. And hopefully that's, you know, what we've what we've come to to create so that when you walk through those doors, you know, no matter what decision you make, um, you know, you're you're getting that incredible product and and really feeling the passion as you've just mentioned you can taste it you know yeah. when when somebody's putting that passion and love into their food and in the kitchen you you can tell for sure well it sounds awesome it sounds amazing and personally as somebody who works in durham uh I'm excited to have some really good food on the go to yes. be able to pick up. So I will be taking advantage of. And so for the people that want to go and get takeout, you just go to Durham Food Hall? DurhamFoodHall.com. Dot com, dot com, and You'll you can see order. links that say order online. Click that link. And we have a landing page where all of the vendors pop up. It tells you the days that they're open, the times that they're open, because that is varying a little bit right now, again, with COVID and, and limited staff. Eventually, we will be, um, as we got Joe to paint on our uh, special guest to paint on our doors. He's the best. Yes, he is. And he painted all day, every day. That will be, you know, eventually our opening time frame. <laughs> um, but right now it is a little bit different. So we've got all of our, our hours and days there. Somebody's open every day, so right. that's good. Um, and yeah, and you can look at everyone's menu. It does, our POS system, we use Toast as well. The POS system does kind of oddly ask you to start an order and to be able to view the menus, don't let that fool you or discourage you. You're not starting any transaction until you, yeah, you know, put now. something in the cart. You just click it so that you can now get inside the menu. And exactly. See what you're doing. Yeah. Exactly. We've had a little bit of, we, you know, generations are are definitely um, becoming more apparent, and the differences in technology comfortability and, um, you know. Uh, are you about to say okay, boomer? Now, is yeah, that right. Here? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, no, it's and it's obvious you've done a great job. Of curating and intimately knowledgeable of all your vendors so thank you for that and not just being like a 
the food hall owner and then I'm there every that. day yeah. with them so, so we're family well, we have some takeout food for you yeah. as well proof alcohol ice cream is in our, our freezers Second. out here in the uh, in the lobby so before you get out of here you can grab yourself a pint of whatever flavors you'd like such as uh, coconut rum or apple pie moonshine or bourbon caramel and everything is uh, 7% alcohol inside of one pint think differently about your dessert from our friend uh, Jen out there in Columbia, South Carolina. We uh, crossed the border because the product is amazing and awesome. So you take that home with you and uh, you'll have a good time with that. But Matt? Yeah. Otherwise, uh, people, go to the Durham Food Hall. You will eat and drink very merrily. Come see us. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the NC f and Podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember... Five stars are encouraged.